You can stay, you can compliantly stay in Christianity or you can defiantly leave or you can defiantly stay, refusing to stay within the boundaries and boxes that the system has set up for you. I'm choosing option three and I'm not leaving and that's where I'm at. Pro-homo theology has equal access in Christianity, has equal representation historically, and I will not be quiet. And if you're gonna make a claim about living out truth, or if you're gonna make a claim about having real truth, you better check yourself before you wreck yourself because your opinion is nothing more than a political stump speech. Hi, my name is Leo WT, and you have found your way to the Conversations Podcast. Conversations exist to create spiritually minded conversations about life. We desire to create safe space for dialogue and community. We desire to come together regularly and intentionally to generate conversations about life, belief, and the intersection of the two. Everyone is welcome at the conversation. Friends, what is up? How are you? It's Leo WT here. Well, I promised you guys that I would keep you updated on my seminary studies and all of that. And so I decided to make a project, right, for my final project that would actually be in the form of a video. So that's where we're at today. I want to share with you folks some stuff that I have been learning. Um, and I'm going to do it as this is my basically my cumulative project for my LGBTQIA spirituality class. So I'm going to share this in a couple places on Facebook. So hopefully everybody sees it. Yay. <laughs> Thank you, Rob, for letting me know you could hear me. I actually have a new mic set up today. So I'm really glad that you can hear me. I'm trying something new because my last mic setup wasn't working quite right. Um, if I didn't, if I didn't want to destroy my setup right now, I would show you that I have four different mics in my vicinity um, and I'm only using one of them and I'm in a new format with it. So what I am going to chat with you folks about is a little bit about the way that science and theology impact each other. I don't know if you can see the video title for this, but I named it Pro Homo. Uh, the, the name of the video is Pro Homo, the ways in which science and theology affirm queer existence in the Bible. So we're going to chat about that. And there's one thing I've really noticed um, is that in the like 40s, 50s, 60s, right, there was this big sort of shift in the way that the church and society viewed LGBTQ people. Now, for the duration of my video, I might use the word homosexuality, which I actually think is just like kind of an icky word because it's been used to demean people. Um, but I'm going to use it because it's in a lot of the research. And actually, that's a part of the interesting fact of the whole genesis of this conversation is that the word homosexuality didn't even exist until uh, 18. 99, I believe, and it was uh, like officially coined in the 1900s. I can give you the exact stats on that when I get down to the book in my list of references, but I actually have all of my references here, right here in physical form to share with you guys. So, but yeah, uh, the, the word homosexuality wasn't in, in the Bible until 1946. And we also see some other interesting things in that area. We have, um, what's known as the Kinsey Report, which a lot, I don't know if a lot of people have heard of, or if it's just something that gay people hear of, but it was basically one of the biggest scientific studies published about sexual behavior in America. And it, it did talk about homosexuality as well. Um, so Alfred Kinsey was the scientist along with two other scientists. And you can find more in, uh, information on this on the Kinsey, K-I-N-S-E-Y, institute.org. But basically, Kinsey published two studies on human sexuality that uh, really changed the shape of the way we think about science and development. And it's my thesis with this project that, that Kinsey's work in the science field had a very big impact in the field of theology. And most people don't know, they just hear the Kinsey scale, which the Kinsey scale is supposed to be this thing like where zero is exclusively heterosexual and uh, six is exclusively homosexual in terms of your sexual behaviors, right? Now we know, and even the Kinsey Institute in its modern form knows that there's a broader conversation about sexuality, but at that time, 
it was a big deal for Kinsey to even bring into the public the fact that people did have exclusively homosexual behaviors possibly and then to quantify that so that was a big deal but what a lot of people don't know is there was actually two Kinsey reports there was a Kinsey report about male sexuality and female sexuality which is really interesting because uh, if you look back in the resources the report on female sexuality really inflamed the church even more than the report on male sexuality which I think is interesting but we'll get to that later on um, but so the female or the male study happened in 1948 and the female study happened in 1946 I believe um, I'm gonna double check my facts on that but yes yeah, so there's those two studies right and also if you'll remember with me right around that same time the word homosexuality was supplanted into the biblical text so I think there's definitely a correlation between homosexuality being put in the Bible supposedly explicitly and what was happening in terms of scientific development Kinsey is definitely problematic, Rob, for sure, but I think he started a lot of good stuff. So there's this kind of understanding that Kinsey um, was, you know, like anti-Christian, uh, which I think is really unfortunate. Um, there's an article uh, by Robert C. Johnson called Kinsey versus Christianity, A Clash of Paradigms on Human Nature. And what I think is really interesting about this article, it was written in February of 1975. It was in the Quarterly Journal of Speech, volume 61. But Robert Johnson in this, he asserts that just by the title, the title is biased. And he seems to assert that Kinsey's report is not compatible with Christianity. But when you do the research, that's that's not actually the case. Um, but his, his, his quote from him really starts us off. Uh, Johnson said, the wide circulation of sex data and the resultant controversy made the publication of the Kinsey reports not only an important event scientifically, but important culturally and rhetorically as well. And I would add to Johnson that the publishing of this sex data made this these reports wildly important theologically. And as Robert Johnson proposes, he, he kind of proposes that Christianity and Kinsey are opposites. But I found some other resources, um, and one of them was also from the Journal of American History, but in 2008. And um, author R. Marie Griffith wrote an article entitled The Religious Encounters of A.C. Kinsey, in which he talks about, uh, or in which the author talks about the actual breadth of religious encounters that Kinsey had. And in this, there are as many positive as there were negative encounters. So why do we have this weird unfair contrast like it does it doesn't make any sense to me right it doesn't and so you know people always try to say that Kinsey was coming after the judeo-christian uh, view of sexuality but i want to dispel with one myth before we go any further uh, people who are trying to claim judeo-christian continuity it's really, really frustrating to me because Judaism doesn't have deep-seated anti-LGBTQ vibes. You can look on transtorah.org and you see some resources by Rabbi Elliot Kukla uh, from 2006, where Rabbi Kukla talks about the different terms for gender diversity that were in the Torah. There were six different classes of genders talked about in Jewish tradition. And you can also tell from books like uh, A Rainbow Thread, um, which is it's an anthology of queer Jewish texts. So the idea of um, anti LGBTQ behaviors in Judaism, as purported by Christian speakers needs to stop. Because Jews can't speak for Christian Christians, it's not fair. Jews can't speak for or Christians can't speak for Jews. That's not fair. And so to pull the Torah into a discussion about anti-LGBTQ rhetoric is unfair and it's supersessionist and it's theologically inappropriate and Christians need to stop speaking over Jews. So that's a slight tangent. Um, but I wanted, I wanted to talk about that because if we're talking about just Christian history, there is Christian ways of interpreting the Old Testament or the Jewish scriptures in which Christians really just override what the original authors are saying and they put their uh, they read Jesus onto the text of the Old Testament when it's not really there. But in um, in the article, The Religious Encounters of Kinsey, uh, author uh, R. Marie Griffith said that although he was scrupulously secular in his own convictions, Kinsey played a 
critical religious role in the United States by enlivening Protestant liberals to reconsider and indeed revise their re views about sex. And it's really important that we realize for as much negativity has come out around homosexuality from the church, that wasn't initially there. And what you see if you look on this timeline of theological developments as they parallel with scientific developments, you see this intersection in the late 40s, early 50s of public discourse, social discourse, philosophical discourse, and theological discourse around sexuality. And what's really important is that we call out right now that there is no universal Christian stance on LGBTQ people, period. It doesn't exist. From the very beginning of time, there wasn't a rub. From the modern times, there was a rub that was created. And I think that's really, really important to know is that there were sections of Christianity that very, very much absolutely understood what Kinsey was saying and allowed their theology to be shaped by what we know about human orientation. So uh, Kinsey is binary. Um, but I think he started a good conversation, so. I'm just gonna take a moment and comment in the comment bar. In case of frequent interruptions, I am recording this also, just so folks know. But yeah, so what happened, right? around this move where Kinsey was bringing up these facts about human sexuality and the theological responses were happening. I think what happened was Kinsey's reports galvanized two separate strains of Christian theology, but we only hear about one of them. One strain of theology that was galvanized by Alfred Kinsey's reports were anti-LGBTQ rhetoric and theology. And I'm using the term theology lightly because it's nothing more than conjecture and a giant self, you know, aggrandizing think piece bias. But uh, the other strand of theology that came out was actually queer theology. It was it was pro, um, it was pro homo, right? <laughs> it was pro homo. So, um, in the book Queer Religiosities, um, we talk. It talks a lot about why there was such a violent response to Kinsey's reports to the Bible being put in the homosexual uh, put the word homosexuality being put into the Bible and to the overall discourse around the like mid-century uh, discourse around homosexuality and in Queer Religiosities by Melissa Wilcox um, the author talks about hegemony and hegemony is this idea that we have to maintain power by keeping everybody believing the same thing. And what happens with hegemony is that hegemony is a form of power so complete that it appears natural and normal even to those who suffer under it. And if people believe their oppression is natural and normal, they aren't likely to change it. So the church, in order to maintain control and order of society, and of congregations try to enforce theological hegemony by telling people it's wrong to be gay. And that lined up with the newly supplanted word of homosexuality in the Bible. And they were trying to create a totalitarian system where there was no other views, but there was other views and they were popular and powerful and they were there. But what happened is people tried to force out the pro-homo theology, if you will. I'm just coining that phrase right now. But people tried to force out the pro-homo theology because it threatened the control of the church. And a lot of times what happened was when people were asked to choose between social justice ideals and institutional loyalty, many progressives walked with their convictions out of the churches. And that's a quote from Reforming Sodom, Protestants and the Rise of Gay Rights in America. Now, if you'll recall from er the earlier article, Protest liberal Protestants were the ones that were pro-homo, that were pro-social justice. And in an effort for the conservative church to maintain hegemony, they're like, yo, you gotta hate everybody else. And that's where we see how galvanizing it is to tell people that they're wrong and that they're going to hell and to just propagate this sort of hateful rhetoric. But the problem is, that's not really what the Bible says or really where the church as an institution stands. And in order to understand that, we have to go back a little bit. 
So I want to bring up a book called Christian Christianity, Social Tolerance and Homos Homosexuality by John Boswell. This is an amazing book um, that talks about gay people in Western Europe from the beginning of the Christian era to the 14th century. So we're talking about the church in antiquity here. And it it really is important um, that we understand that within Christianity and antiquity, there was no bias towards homosexuality. And I'm going to read a quote by John Boswell that speaks to that. Not only does there appear to be no general prejudice against gay people amongst early Christians, there does not seem to have been any reason for Christianity to adopt a hostile attitude towards homosexual behavior. It's really important that we realize that. If you want to read the book, I encourage you to read the book. There's so many resources in here about um, homosexuality in antiquity, in Christianity, how it was spoke of, how it wasn't villainized, and how the modern understanding of homosexuality of, as evil is put on to the text. It's not in the text. So I encourage you to check this out. But not only does Boswell say that there's no prejudice against gay people amongst early Christians, he goes a step further and says, there doesn't seem to have been any reason for there to be prejudice against gay people in early Christianity. I think it's really important that we realize that because we have this sort of one narrative where we're taught, you know what I mean, it's wrong, but there were a lot of social forces coming to play. So that brings us back up to speed with Kinsey. We've seen that in antiquity, there, there wasn't anti-LGBTQ attitudes in, in antiquity, not from Christianity, not from history, and not from Judaism either, which Christians like to try to speak over, but there is not anti-LGBTQ biases in any of those things. But a big thing that happened was the church needed to regain power in the midst of this sort of liberation movement of the early to mid 1900s. And one of the ways that they could do that is to capitalize on the newly pathologized word of homosexuality. Homosexuality, like I said before, was not a word until 1901 when it came out of German psychoanalytic fields. Uh, you can find that information in a book called um, Recruiting Young Love by Mark Hugh Johnson, which I'm going to bring up later. But in the early 1900s, we pathologized homosexuality. That means, the word pathologized means we made it a disease. When it wasn't understood to be a disease originally, right? But we did that. And then you see the furthering of that in 1946 when the word homosexuality was put into the Bible. For more information from that, for that, you can check out 1946, the movie. It's a documentary that's up and coming about the way the word homosexuality was put into the NRS or into the RSV Bible. It was not in there originally. And in the documentary, they pull all of the translation notes from the Yale archives. Uh, the people who translated the RSV Bible were working at Yale and they saved all of their transcription notes. And what actually ended up happening is that those same transcribers that put the word homosexuality in the Bible, they later recanted and took it out. And they said, we are really sorry, it shouldn't have been there, but the bell was already rung. So if you wanna find out more and read the original transcription notes, I would encourage you to check out 1946, the movie. So we have Kinsey happening in the late 1940s, right? His sex study. We have the word homosexuality being put into the Bible in the late 1940s. And we have the pathologizing or diseasifying of homosexuality that took place in the early to mid 1900s. As a fun fact, the word homosexuality was actually removed from the, uh, it was depathologized, if you will, in 1987. In the book Queer Theologies, they talk about, uh, by Chris Greenbro, they talk about that the fact that the American Psychi Psychiatric Association took homosexuality off its list of disorders in 1987. So it's depathologized, it's depathologized um, and it's, it's decriminal. It's becoming decriminalized right around those times in the late 1980s as well, uh, up to 1992. It's becoming decriminalized. But the church is still trying to dig in. And I think one of the reasons they did that, like I said, is to create hegemony. They had to keep the idea that everybody was under the control of the church because they were losing traction with social revolution. A big thing that was happening at the same time as Kinsey was the evangelical figurehead known as Billy Graham. Billy Graham uh, was an evangelical preacher and he really liked to 
tie together the ideas of patriotism and nationalism and Christianity. So another thing that was happening during that time period is also the communist scare, right? And so we see an uptick, if you look at American history, you see an uptick in this like push for patriotism and the red scare and all of this. And then you also see theologically this uh, rise of acceptance of a broader understanding of sexuality than the church has taught for a while, if you look at the Catholic church. Um, so what Billy Graham does is he really links people together in this sort of like evil triumvirate, right? What Billy Graham does is he links together, he links together nationalism, Christian nationalism, Christianity, patriotism, and cultural, and the need for cultural salvation, if you will. Uh, Billy Graham, he believes that the cultural risks posed by Kinsey are situated within a deep spanning cultural disintegration. I'm reading from the book Recruiting Long, Young Love by Mark D. Johnson. And the book is, the book is it's subtitled How Christians Talk About Homosexuality. And uh, he points out in chapter two that um, really what Billy Graham was doing was entrenching people with anti-LGBTQ values. He actually went so far as to assert that because Kinsey was like scientific, uh, that Kinsey was somehow a communist. Like there are real transcriptions of this. There was, you know, there was television during the era that this was happening. But for Billy Graham, um, in one of his radio broadcasts called The Hour of Decision, he's, he very stealthily linked together nationalism, uh, patriarchy, uh, homosexuality, Christianity, and all of these things, and talking about how America needed to be saved from this impending cultural disintegration. And it's really wild. Uh, what Basically what Billy Graham did is, <laughs> I have to read this, um, Billy Graham said that the Bible was the unchanging word of God. Hello, somebody. I don't know if you've heard other organizations that try to say they're just worshiping the word and they just read the Bible and believe what God said. But really that started with Billy Graham and Billy Graham started to push that the Bible was the unchanging word of God. And uh, Mark D. Jordan goes so far as to say, he quotes, uh, Billy Graham opposes the unchanging word of the Bible, which he quotes verse by decontextualized verse in the reassuringly archaic English of the King James Version. The Bible's immutability is demonstrated by its resonant language, familiar from childhood, and its immediate applicability without the need of cultural translation. So much of the Bible's felt authority is the acoustic illusion of immutability. This always present Bible speaks directly to and against Kinsey and his European tutors, as if it had known all along that they were coming to threaten American teenagers. The King James Version is the American mother tongue and the native speech of truly American mothers. This is the way in which Billy Graham decontextualized the Bible and simultaneously posed it as oppositional to Kinsey's reports, to a growing sense of auto bodily autonomy amongst women, to a growing sense of acceptability of LGBTQ people. Billy Graham was like this big, big force in going against that. Uh, Kristen Kobe Dumay in her book, Jesus and John Wayne on page 22 states that more than anyone, Billy Graham knit together the disconnected universe of American evangelicals. And he did that by saying, be scared. Evil is at your front door. You know, you need to turn and repent. And that was the evangelical narrative. And from there, from Billy Graham, you get people like Mark Driscoll, who is literally a theological wild man. He calls himself a Calvinist, but he was actually removed from the church he created. And I got to show you this because I think you guys are going to find this awesome. You know, sometimes I subscribe to stuff because I'm like, I got to keep in touch with this. You know, I got to keep in touch with what's going on on the other side. So I got a text from Mark Driscoll's church today and um, it said, huh, I can't, I can't. He said, morning, open your Bibles to Genesis 19 to learn all about how homosexuality was the token sin of Sodom. And if that is not ridiculous enough, because it's theologically untrue, his website reads real faith. 
there are other pastors out there doing the same thing and they, they have web addresses like living out truth or real faith, when what really they're doing is they're pushing one of two agendas that came out after the Kinsey report. They're pushing the evangelical, um, conservative, hateful rhetoric of anti-LGBTQ um, beliefs. And then there is an equally prevalent pro-homo stream of theology. But a lot of these white men in all of the hubris of straight white Christian men are purporting that they're the only ones. You, you know, you have pastors like Mark Driscoll up in my inbox. You have people um, with, you know, websites that say living out truth and then, you know, billboards that say the cross equals love, but then all the time, but if you're LGBTQ, you're not. You're not of God. And if you speak out against that, you're certainly evil, you know? And this is the evolution that we've got from that galvanizing effect of the Kinsey Report. It's super, super important to realize. But the thing that's important, and the reason that we need to talk about this pro-homo theology, right, is, and I, I'm, I'm saying that knowing it is a gross oversimplification, I just think it's funny, and it's a wordplay on no homo, so roll with me here, people. But um, in, in their book, uh, Queer Theology, Lynn Marie Tonstad, who is a, a currently a associate professor of systematic theology at Yale, brought up this point about Christian apologetics. Christian apologetics means um, basically using the Bible to prove stuff, right? And so in the first portion of her book on queer theology, she devotes this much of the book to saying, well, here's what people say the Bible says about homosexuality. But she ends the chapter by pointing out that there's some very different ways to think about it. And I want to read to you a little passage of Tonstead's. She says, I said at the beginning of this chapter that I will argue the, that queer theology is not or should not be about apologetics. Having canvassed these arguments, it may be clear why that is so. Very few of these apologetic arguments we've looked at so far are theologically rich, insightful, illuminating except perhaps the nexus of arguments from food and circumcision, which she covers in the books. She goes on to say, many of the arguments depend on conditions that were peripheral to central Christian values. What she's saying is a lot of these apologetic strategies are strategies from antiquity that were taken and manipulated by modern Christians to fit an agenda that was never central to Christianity antiquity. Christianity antiquity did not Care, did not have anti-LGBTQ biases, but people have put that on the text by, you know, developing strategies with their own opinions in mind. Um, and then Tonstad makes a great point. Is that all the insight that emerges for Christianity from queer, trans, and non-binary lives? And the point that she's making is that there is actually so much more to glean theologically from the text when we don't truncate it and compartmentalize it and read it in this L evangelical mindset, there is actually more beauty in human life and diversity than we understand. Tonstad goes on to say, the idea that human lives are broken and malformed at the very basic level participates for many in a culture of shame and guilt that needs to be resisted rather than affirmed. And I would argue it needs to be resisted by proving the fact that it was put in the text by modern people. Modern people put in an ancient text a reason to cause shame and control and doubt. That is the most popular tool of the church and of the patriarchy and of capitalism is the ability to control you because you think you're needed, you think you're broken and unworthy and unwhole in and of yourself. Capitalism, patriarchy, and the church, particularly in their view about homosexuality, they keep you coming back wanting more, thinking you're not enough on your own, and that's how they got you. But the thing is, is that anti-LGBTQ attitudes within Christianity are a modern invention. In uh, God and Gay by J. Michelson, J. Michelson quotes uh, an author, George Chauncey, and George Chauncey states, while anti-gay discrimination is popularly thought to have ancient roots, it is in fact a unique and relatively short-lived product of this 20th century. Chauncey, or um, J. 
J. Michelson goes on to talk about all of these other instances and in which queer people lived and moved and had their being, yes, that's a Bible quote, in antiquity, and they were welcomed and celebrated. In the book, Trans Theology by Austin Hartke, Austin talks about a passage in Isaiah that's actually a prayer of blessing for the immigrants uh, and the eunuchs. And in, in the Bible, the eunuchs were queer people by choice, by chance, or by imprisonment, eunuchs were people who had ambiguous gender, some in part to the removing of their testosterone, of their hormone inducing body parts, right? But the Bible is actually pro homo if you read it in a lot of ways. And there is scholar after scholar after scholar after scholar that has arisen from that second strain of theology that came from the split that happened around the time of the Kinsey Report. I just listed a couple, right? Billy Graham, Mark Driscoll, livingouttruth.org or whatever. These are all distinctly anti-LGBTQ strands, but it is so important that we realize that that's not the only thing that came out of the introduction of the Kinsey Report, right? You have an entirely different tradition that is rich and powerful and theologically grounded and well-rehearsed and well-resourced all across the board. And there are authors like Patrick Chang, Marcella althaus reed Reverend Robert Shore Goss, Austin Harkey, Gregory of Nyssa, Julian, <laughs> get this. Okay, so the, those four, four were all modern, but then you've got Gregory of Nyssa, fourth century, Julian of Norwich, I believe for, before 14th century. Then you have people like Theodore Jennings exegeting scriptures from the Bible that talk about maybe the possibility of Jesus being queer, and they're presenting a well-founded case. Now, for me, it's not necessary for Jesus to be queer, but there is there is definitely evidence of that. If you go back to the fourth century within Judaism, you have Rabbi Hillel, who I talked about um, who I talked about earlier, you can find more about Rabbi Hillel on Trans Torah, where Hillel talks about the gender diversity within the Torah. You can read from organizations like Hedaya, which bring together Muslim uh, LGBTQ people. The point is that Abrahamic faiths do not undeniably condemn LGBTQ people, and in particular Christianity. And Christianity needs to stop relying on some faux Judaism to try to prove their point. But the point is that there is a powerful and galvanized pro-homo strain of theology that has deep roots within church history and that has deep roots within biblical scholarship and theology. You can find people like Bishop Megan Rohr, who was the first trans bishop in the Episcopal Church, you can find whole denominations that are LGBTQ affirming, not the least of which being metropolitan community churches and the United Church of Christ. The Episcopal Church is, is friendly. Um, most Protestant mainline denominations are LGBTQ friendly. You have a strain of Anglicanism that's LGBTQ friendly. There are even Catholics who are LGBTQ friendly. Like these all exist, but the voice of these no homo theologians they just will blast you in the face with it with the hubris of straight white Christian men. But the point is, they're not alone. They don't have an intractable claim to the truth. And I think that there's a very powerful strain of pro-homo theology that developed, not the least in part, uh, and was galvanized, not the least in part, by the Kinsey reports in the late 40s and early 1950s. If you stuck around with me so far, I appreciate it. I'm going to be listing all of my sources for this on um, the, the YouTube notes for this. I'm going to put this on my podcast. I do apologize uh, for the, the little bits of bumps here and there with, um, with the transmission, but it will be recorded and posted in full. Uh, so I also was really sucked up into Billy Graham. I grew up in Billy Graham culture. And it's just really important to notice that that is a very specific strain of Christianity that was actually weaponized um, by the American conservative right. If you look up the book Jesus and John Wayne by Kristen Kobe Dumez, or if you look at, um, I did a podcast with Kristen Kobe Dumez on this same topic, right, where we talked about Jesus and John Wayne. And we talked about how evangelicalism was a political strategy. Uh, funny enough, I posted something about that. I posted something about that, I want to say, 13 years ago. I'm looking for my phone here, and I've lost it in my notes, but 13 years ago, 
I posted about evangelicalism and how it was largely a political strategy. I'm gonna see if I can pull it up for you because I said I said apparently I've been on my shit for 13 years, but uh, 13 years ago I posted food for thought. Evangelicalism has never it has never defined itself by theology. It has de designed itself by political issues. And then I went further and said, if you're not committed to the reconciliation of all people on earth, you're not committed to Jesus Christ. And I think those two go hand in hand. But evangelicalism and no homo theology is a modern invention. I'm not saying you have to believe in pro homo theology. I'm just saying you are actually being rude, harmful, spreading misinformation and being willfully ignorant if you choose to say that the only way to be Christian is to be no homo because it's not okay. It doesn't make sense. And if you want to learn some more about particularly Billy Graham and evangelicalism and how it is a political strategy, uh, you can check out how Billy Graham was an advisor to most conservative Republican American presidents in his lifetime. He was spiritual advisors to many presidents. Uh, he was uh, spiritual advisors to Nixon and, and he participated in the Reaganization of the Republican uh, Party, which is where Ronald Reagan decided to galvanize conservative Christian voters by taking a stance that did not pre-exist on abortion. Um, evangelicalism is a strategy and you guys have been bought. The alt-right, the conservative Christian right, Christian America has been bought. The phrase, uh, you know, one nation under God was an advertising campaign by the National Association of Manufacturers. Um, it was a it was a capitalistic move to include evangelicalism in this sweeping realm of Christian nationalism. And Billy Graham was one of the OGs of linking together Christian nationalism, the patriarchy, patriotic attitudes and anti LGBTQ attitudes. So I'm not saying you got to believe me, but I'm saying you can't discount me because I stand on the shoulders of a lot of people who've gone before. There are Jewish scholars, there are Christian scholars. There are black scholars, there are white scholars, there are female scholars, there are male scholars, there are non-binary scholars, there are transgender scholars, all of them talking about a broader, more expansive, less weaponized view of the Bible, and especially a view that takes itself critically and is responsible for the harm it commits in society. And there's a great quote that I'd like to finish up with from the article, The Religious Encounters of Alfred Kinsey. It's gonna take me a second to pull it up here. But I think it's really important. Um, it's really important. If you wanna see some more evangelical um, hate for Kinsey, you can check out that picture. I'm just waiting to see if it's showing. You can check out that picture that says, I accuse Kinsey. This was sort of the dialogue that was being published at the time. Um, but this very much sums up the attitudes of this, this uh, mindset was, I accuse Kinsey, the evangelicals accuse Kinsey of, I guess, exposing human sexuality that already pre-existed. But I think it's really important that the church realize there is a broader scope on this and that Americans realize there is a broader scope within the church. Um, in the article, The Religious Encounters of Alfred Kinsey, author Marie Griffith says, the church has a special responsibility to help people handle guilt feelings that they may have engendered. And I think that's really important because the guilt feelings of people who are LGBTQ, of people who have different sexual ethics than evangelical people, those guilt feelings are engendered by the church, they're engendered by no homo theology, and it's not fair because people have wielded the power of God to make people feel unlovable, unloved, and unwhole. And the reality is that the church has engendered feelings of guilt and shame, not God. There is equal, if not more, claim to pro-homo theology than there is for no homo theology but the hubris of straight white evangelical men has convinced us there isn't. So I would encourage you folks to share this video, to raise a concern, and to not let yourself be bought by the conservative right. And if you're, um, really, really importantly, if you're a Christian, you don't have to leave. You can defiantly stick around. To quote my friend, Glenn Sieper, I have to pull this up, but my friend Glenn posted a really important post about being a Christian 
who sticks around. Now, I take a lot of heat. I take as much heat from atheists as I do from Christians because people want me to come down hard one way or the other about why I'm still involved in the church. My friend Glenn Siepert, who runs an amazing podcast called the What If Podcast, he posted this yesterday, and I really, really resonated with it. He said, from Brian McLaren's new book, Brian McLaren is a great progressive Christian author you should check out, but from Brian's new book, you can stay, you can compliantly stay in Christianity, or you can defiantly leave, or you can defiantly stay, refusing to stay within the boundaries and boxes that the system has set up for you. I'm choosing option three, and I'm not leaving, and that's where I'm at. Pro-homo theology has equal access in Christianity, has equal representation historically, and I will not be quiet. If you're going to make a claim about living out truth, or if you're going to make a claim about having real truth, you better check yourself before you wreck yourself, because your opinion is nothing more than a political stump speech. Pro-homo. This has been the Conversations Podcast. Thank you so much for joining. If you have any questions or comments or just want to get involved, feel free to join the conversation on social media. You can find us at Conversations Official on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. And please don't forget to rate, follow, and share this podcast. We're available on Anchor, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Thank you so much for joining the conversation.